All right. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you to our Seidenberg series, um, our webinar series that we're having for accepted students. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the uh, Seidenberg experience as well as the Applied Data Sciences and Networking Lab. Um, with me today, we have a bunch of folks from Seidenberg on the student, faculty, and staff side of the house. Um, Dr. Jim Gabberty is here, who's going to be talking about the Applied Data Sciences um, and Networking Lab. We have Emma uh, Kleinberg, who is our Academic Advisor in New York City. Um, Stephanie Elson is here. She's the Assistant Dean of Recruitment and Retention. Um, Jessica Drennan is also with us today from the Admissions Department. So feel free in the chat to ask questions um, to her or to any of us about your financial aid questions. Um, and then we have four students with us as well. So Brandon DeLuca, Kyle Hanson, Sammy Chen Lee, and Vivian um, Nate. They are all here today uh, to discuss their experience and the things that they've done while at the Seidenberg School and Pace University. Um, so welcome everybody. There's some familiar names in the webinar. So I appreciate you guys coming out um, on this sadly. Here in New York is a rainy, dreary day. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Emma, who is our advisor, like I said, in New York City, and she's going to talk just to briefly about our programs and what we offer here at the Seidenberg School. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're happy to have you here. Um, I'm just going to give a, a very broad overview of our undergraduate programs. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I'll make sure you have my contact information. You're always welcome to, uh, to reach out if you have additional questions. Um, so uh, we have four undergraduate degree programs, each of which is 120 credits, um, which is actually really interesting because all of the other uh, programs or most of the other programs at Pace are actually 128 credits. So you get, you know, you get to, uh, to, to, do, to experience that, uh, take advantage of that. Um, so we have four undergraduate programs. Um, we have the BS and the BA in computer science. Um, the main differences between those two programs uh, include a couple of extra uh, mandatory core classes for the BS degree. Um, and the BA degree has a little more flexibility. If you're not 100% sure computer science is for you or you don't wanna jump right into it, um, there is a required minor. So there's an opportunity to pursue those computer science courses um, and then also to, um, you know, to take, to take a minor as well in any school within, within the university. Um, some of the classes that we offer uh, for our computer science programs um, include programming, data structures, software engineering, um, network and security, operating systems, um, all that good stuff. So that's, that's our computer science, our two computer science programs. Um, we also have our information technology BS. Um, that is more focused on the hardware side, and you can read a little bit of, of a description um, on the slide here, um, but that does focus on hardware. Um, it does include a, a focus. Um, we have a couple of focuses that you can choose from, um, you know, web and digital media, security, networking, computer forensics, software development, a couple of other options as well. Um, and there is an opportunity as well to take, um, you know, to take three other classes within the same program that's uh, required for interdisciplinary focus, which also means that this program is a good way to incorporate a minor if you're interested in doing so. And then our last program, our BS in Information Systems, uh, is kind of a combination between the software and hardware elements um, and focuses a lot on the business aspect of it. Um, so that's that kind of takes some classes from both programs as well as some programs with the, or some classes within Lubin, our uh, business school. Um, some marketing, accounting classes, things like that. So um, if you have any questions about any of those, please feel free to let me know. Uh, and then here are some of the hot topics today uh, in technology that we do cover here at Seidenberg, cybersecurity, data science and analytics, computer programming, and artificial intelligence. Um, these are all big uh, you know, buzzwords in the technology world. Uh, you know, people are hiring for careers related to these terms and, and including these aspects. And also um, our programs cover them in both practical and theoretical ways. So you uh, not only learn, you know, these, these simple problems and, and in a theoretical sense, you learn how to actually apply them to your real life. So um, we do really focus on a lot of these big terms as well. 
And uh, now um, I'm going to let Dr. Gowdy speak. He's our Associate Dean and a Professor of Information Systems. Sure. Uh, can you just go back uh, two slides, uh, Jill, if you don't mind? <clears throat> so for those that are joining us this afternoon, welcome. Um, I thought I would just take a, a second just to uh, add a little bit to what Emma had said about the uh, different baccalaureate programs we offer to you, because I know that uh, a lot of people have questions as to which of these degree programs leads to uh, what, you know, different kind of uh, job and career paths that students can take. So essentially, um, irrespective of, of whether you take computer science or IT or IS, uh, all of the um, different um, uh, career paths that are available on the next slide, which we don't change yet, uh, you can get involved with any of them. So, if, you know, just because you you're, you choose one versus another doesn't mean you're pigeonholed into that uh, specific uh, curriculum or subject area. But just briefly, uh, computer science is more of a mathematical uh, algorithm-based discipline where you learn how to solve problems and you get kind of closer to the solution of a specific application. Um, information uh, systems would follow computer science in terms of, of the level of um, complexity. And that would be uh, information systems, which again is related more to the business side of, of computing. So it's kind of the intersection of business and computer science. So people that go into information systems uh, study things like soft systems analysis and design, project management, uh, they can go into telecommunications, et cetera, but it's all uh, taught in the, in the perspective of solving uh, common business problems uh, using technology as the means to do that. And finally, the last one, IT. IT is kind of like the, the, the um, all-encompassing stack that pretty much has everything to do with hands-on uh, technology. So if you just go one more slide forward. So, you know, we put these four different uh, uh, major uh, areas of concern out there to, to give you a little thought. There's one that's missing that should be there, which is telecommunications, but I'm going to be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, but we, you know, these, these four suffice uh, to be indicative of the kind of jobs that are available to you uh, and our graduates when they graduate. So cybersecurity is a, one of my uh, near and, and dear uh, topics of interest um, because you can get involved both as a uh, what we call a systems intrusion person so someone who is hired by a firm to actually attack the firm kind of like hiring someone to break into your apartment or your home to see how good your defenses are uh, and we, we call that uh, uh, the red team and uh, the blue teams are people that defend uh, you know the intrusion of cybersecurity. data science and analytics I'll have much more to say about in a moment uh, that has to do with predictive analytics. There are a ton of jobs, especially in New York City, for people that are involved with data science and analytics. Computer programming is a catch-all. People that can code in Python, Java, uh, Ruby, C language, um, you know, any of the modern day languages and can build an application using different languages are in very, very high demand. And you can work at, in any industry in any specific sector within that industry at any level you'd like. So you could be part of a team, you can work, you know, these days a lot of people are working uh, offline at home remotely where they're writing little snippets of code as part of a bigger team application. Um, so a computer program is kind of like the, you know, the catch-all phrase and there are tens of thousands of jobs just in the New York City uh, arena alone that, uh, that encompass computer programming. And artificial intelligence, as you know, uh, that's having computers make decisions for us. Uh, that's a very, very uh, hot topic these days. And Manhattan companies such as Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, all of whom have presences in, in, in the city, uh, they're looking at this artificial intelligence as a way to keep their business models going forward. Next slide. So... If you would bear with me for a few minutes, I'll give you kind of a lay of the land of um, one of the features of, of Seidenberg that we're very proud of and that a lot of our uh, competitor schools don't necessarily offer. And that is this notion of an applied data sciences and networking lab. 
So the ADSN, the Applied Data Science of the Networking Lab, uh, that's a concept that uh, I came up with about five years ago. And I approached the dean and said, listen, I want to buy a whole bunch of hardware. I want to buy a bunch of telecommunications gear. I need some space in the university. And I'm going to break us into three different um, hands-on um, training areas where people get hands-on access into real-world um, uh, solutions, real-world applications in the, in the telecommunications world, in the cybersecurity world, and, of course, in the data science world. The first one, uh, the Cisco. So if you look at uh, netacad. I think it's .org or .com, one or the other, I forget which it is, uh, but it's Cisco Networking Academy. If you Google that, you'll find out that probably about one in 20 schools in the United States are a certified Cisco Networking Academy. Um, and what does that do for you? Well, um, we offer training, hands-on training, um, to people that are interested in building networks and building out telecommunications uh, gear and doing things that are related to telecommunications uh, with the anticipation of working in the, uh, in the tech world upon graduation. Uh, so if you think about when you're walking down the street and you see all those cameras that are popping up everywhere, uh, believe it or not, those are being put there by the NYPD and, and, and met other metropolitan police departments. And uh, those tens of thousands of cameras that are popping up everywhere these days, all of that stuff has to be connected to these devices called switches and routers. And uh, those in turn are used to build networks. So if someone says, you know, bring up the picture of Midtown North, or, you know, I want to see who's around the Statue of Liberty, or, you know, they push a few buttons and bingo, the police or the, the people that watch out for safety, um, have access to that sort of stuff. In addition, uh, when you walk into retail uh, stores like Macy's and Nordstrom's and, and, and other uh, stores, um, and your phone has an access point that it's speaking to inside the store to allow you to connect to their, uh, their router or you know, their access point, um, all those devices, and again, these are not only you know just in uh, retail stores like the big uh, shopping center stores. They're also in Starbucks, McDonald's, the post office, you know, train station, you name it. Anywhere where you can get a signal to hop on to an access point, all of that stuff goes back to these routers and switches that we're going to we'll, we'll see in a few minutes. Um, and we teach you how to actually build and program uh, networks in a hands-on fashion. And, and we actually actively promote you to become CCNA certified. Uh, so that's a Cisco um, network administrator certification that uh, we find helps people to um, get jobs in, in a very, very fast pace. In fact, Cisco in Midtown constantly asks us to give us the names of people who are graduating that went through the Cisco Networking Academy uh, suite of courses and picked up a, a certification or so along the line uh, to reach out to them to hire them. Uh, so I mentioned New York City Police Department. There's about 200 open jobs right now to work at one police plaza in the telco area to help uh, people program all these switches and devices. Um, I use the word certification. What's a certification? That's a very, very big term and it has a lot of uh, meaning these days. So people all around the country and indeed around the world are looking to start their baccalaureate degrees and they're thinking about whether to take a BA or a BS, uh, should they go on for a master's program, um, will I be able to find a job when I graduate, et cetera. And pretty much it's, you know, other than the, the Ivy Leagues and the top, top, top schools, most schools in the U.S., whether, it, you know, the, there are a couple of dozen schools in New York City metropolitan area and throughout, throughout the U.S., if you have a Bachelor of Science in IT or Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, it's all basically roughly the same because we're all using the same textbooks, we're all using the same syllabi, et cetera. Certain schools go above and beyond and try to put a little twist or something special that they offer to their students to help them get jobs. Uh, we are one of the top 10 internship schools in the United States uh, in helping people get jobs. So it, it's virtually impossible to go through Pace University and get a degree from Seidenberg and not be able to find a job. And one of the things that distinguishes you 
from being able to find a job is uh, is to supplement your your academic career. Your, in other words, your Bachelor of, of Science, for example, or your Bachelor of Arts program that you take, and supplement that with some independent study that uh, you pick up a certification. And there are different organizations that certify um, people in different areas. So Microsoft has a whole set of certifications. Cisco has certifications. This organization called SANS, which is a top, top, top um, cybersecurity uh, organization. They have a whole bunch of certifications and it shows technology. You're not just someone who went to school and took a bunch of courses and studied hard and got good grades. You actually spend time working in, for example, this lab that we run at uh, 163 William Street and uh, Satellite up in, uh, in Westchester where people get hands-on uh, training and hands-on access to the various technologies that interest them. The second item, oh, and by the way, the Cisco Networking Academy uh, courses we offer, because we're a Cisco Networking Academy certified school, the, the beginning courses are offered to students for free. If you Google the cost of how much it costs to get a Cisco certification, you're gonna spend two, $3,000 to take a course by some for-profit organization that will teach you networking. Why pay for that when we offer that for free to you as a supplement uh, to your schooling so that you get actual real world hands-on access to the technology that all the companies uh, use. So everybody knows Cisco, they're used by everybody. If you have certification that shows that you know what you're doing with Cisco, uh, it makes it very easy for a company to hire you because you, you've proven to to Cisco that you know what you're doing and know your way around a switch and a router. Same thing is true with cybersecurity, which is the second uh, item on the list. And we have some panelists today that will talk to you a little bit more about cybersecurity. So cybersecurity uh, essentially is, is the, you know, um, the trying to prevent the hacking and to, to harden the defenses that organizations have to keep the bad guys, other countries that, that wish us ill are constantly stealing our stuff. Uh, people from all over the world are trying to get access to your bank account, sending you spamware, trying to put malware on your computers, et cetera. And everybody has been touched by a bad experience with cybersecurity. We even have people that um, have, you know, Zoom bombed these webinars at Pace and other schools um, where, where, you know, the bad guys have figured out a way to kind of break into a meeting like this. And, you know, they get in and say a few curse words and then they hang up or, you know, they do whatever just to prove that they can, they can do that sort of stuff. So cybersecurity is uh, another one of those areas where every company has a need for cybersecurity um, people, uh, not only to defend and set up their equipment in a way that kind of prevents malware from being installed on computers, but uh, also as a way to train people to be attackers, the to, 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 to so-called uh, so hackers, the people that we hire that do the red team exercises that try to break into um, people's uh, people's systems. I'll tell you a very, very quick story as an aside. So I, I come from the industry, from the IT industry before coming into academia, long time ago, 15 years ago, uh, I was with a friend of mine who was a, a senior vice president at a big bank downtown, and he was paying some organization about $25,000 to determine whether or not they could gain access into the email system that was used by the bank. I was literally sitting in this guy's office 10 minutes after the exercise began. And by the way, he put a, a $10,000 bonus up where if they could crack into the email server or the email system of the, this specific bank, he would, uh, on, on day one, he would give them a $10,000 bonus. Within 15 minutes after the exercise started, they had uh, successfully used something called a social, um, what's it called, social, I forget the, the second term, but uh, they, they were able to go in and do the means of uh, socializing with people and talk their way into the network and actually got onto the network. And within 15 minutes, someone had a, was inside of his system sending the email. Uh, so, so that has been a problem 15 years ago. It's a problem today. It's going to be with us tomorrow, et cetera. Uh, so, so we'll talk more about cyber in a few minutes. The third one, data science. Uh, for those of you that are interested in working, in retail or anything to do with um, public facing organizations. Um, data science would be a good fit for you. 
<clears throat> so here's kind of an example that ties all this stuff together. And hopefully some of you will, um, the light bulbs will go off in your head. You walk into a Macy's department store or a Nordstrom's or, you know, I think they're still in, in uh, a lot of these days, Neiman Marcus, uh, or wherever you walk into any your favorite store and you have your cell phone with you. And your cell phone, unbeknownst to you, is pinging every couple of seconds uh, to find out, to triangulate to the telecommunication towers that are owned by Verizon and such, um, to let them know where to reach you in case they have to forward a phone call to your specific device. If you have Bluetooth turned on or if you have Wi-Fi turned on on your phones, which probably 95% of you do right now, uh, your phone is also pinging to determine if there are local access points or routers that your phone could connect to. So uh, sometimes when you walk into a store, McDonald's, you may have an unsolicited uh, text message come up from McDonald's that says, please you know, click here if you want to connect to our, our router or if you're in Macy's or what have you. But anyway, you're walking around in your Macy's store with your phone, and that Macy's store has routers that are in the ceilings and in the walls all over the place in the, in the stores on different floors. And as you walk around, because they can triangulate your position, not GPS, but it's another way of tricking the system as though it was GPS, where they know how much time you spend at each counter. They know how much time you spend on one floor versus another floor. Uh, so you go and you sniff some cologne or some perfume for five seconds. And you walk over and look at some some gloves, maybe some leather gloves, end of the season, get a good deal. You go downstairs, you look at some um, American tourist luggage, you need to buy an umbrella, so you go upstairs and you're walking all around Macy's for half an hour. It's the first time you've ever visited that store. And the phone, the phone that you're carrying is beeping out signals that are picked up by Macy's, which says, okay, there's a phone out there with a 15 digit code, uh, the, the EMIE uh, number, and um, we don't know who this is. But then you finally decide you're going to you know, purchase something. So you go up to a cash register, you put something on the counter, you pay for it, you hand them your Visa card uh, or American Express or however you pay for the thing. As soon as they swipe that card, that card identifies you, your name. So what Macy's does without you knowing it, it ties your phone that's been pinging with, you know, with, uh, your, to, your, to your name, to your information. And that's why we could walk into a Macy's and not really do anything and then not really make that many purchases and then start getting coupons, unsolicited email from them where you buy some cologne, you, you log on to your computer when you get home and you get five uh, contacts for cologne coupons. Like, how do they know I bought cologne? Well, you, you, you had your phone with you. You didn't even use your phone, but you had it with you when you made a purchase. That whole world of tracking customers or prospective customers uh, and to do predictive analytics is known as data science. So we have, uh, as one of our big projects in our lab, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, a, an application that we, uh, we simulate an Amazon uh, purchasing experience. So data science is all about um, using uh, analytics to predict uh, future behavior. And uh, when one of my student interns, what that because I hire interns that work in the lab, uh, when one of my student interns was was speaking about what we're doing to a company called Michael Kors, the uh, the, the jewelry company that's headquartered in Manhattan, uh, they offered her an on the spot job uh, because when she was describing, you know, where we look for ways to predict what customers have been purchasing, what time they purchase, how big their purchases are, in a way to predict in the future what their purchases might look like. Uh, the people at Michael Kors, their eyes got the biggest sauces and they said that's exactly what we need uh, people to do. So if you have experience with that, go hire you. She turned that job down and instead took a job at Google. Um, so next slide, please. So here's a picture of us uh, from three years ago. We were crammed into two rooms that were kind of side by side. And uh, those are people that are working on one of those three topic areas, uh, cybersecurity, uh, data science, or telecommunications. Um, the, the, the proof, uh, you know, when I first uh, came up with this, I forgot how much money I asked for, a couple of hundred thousand dollars and X amount of square footage at the university. And they said, okay, 
If Gabberty wants to buy toys to play with the students, let's see what he can do with them. Um, and so far to bat uh, every single one of the assistants that has worked for me in the lab, and I have on average about six people that work in the lab with me every single semester. And in addition to that, the students themselves participate. But every person that has worked in that lab has gotten multiple job offers and has been picked up immediately upon hire. So it's become a very, very good thing for us to have. And it allows me to go back, it allowed me to go back to uh, the powers that be in the university and say, give me more space, give me more money. Let's keep doing this because it's working wonderfully. We, we actually got a big grant to, to do a bunch of things there. So um, the, uh, the students that you see there are uh, graduate, undergraduate, and again, maybe one or two of them were working for me at the time. The other were students that were just hanging out in between classes or after classes where they, you know, they, they take their regular courses. Uh, they're at the university. They decide maybe on Monday afternoons or Tuesday mornings or Friday late, late afternoon to just stop by and hang out and say, hey, I want to learn Python and I know nothing about Python. Or I'd like to learn a little bit about this networking stuff that Gabberty's always talking about. Can you show me what that's about? Or I want to crack passwords. I want to crack somebody's password. I want to hack into somebody's phone, et cetera. So next slide. So uh, the equipment that we purchased is there in front of you. So you see uh, those, are, those are telecommunication cabinets, and those are the routers and switches um, that uh, are above that monitor in the middle of that, uh, that, that tall cabinet. Those are the same thing that you have in your homes, uh, your little Linksys with your two antennas that you have popping up or whatever kind of device you have, probably cost you 100 bucks. Uh, maybe you plug six, six things into it or what have you. Um, those are the industrial use size where they have 48 ports on them and those are much more sophisticated. The students in that picture are, are actually putting together a server uh, which slides into that cabinet. That's a server uh, that has several terabytes worth of storage and I, I think two terabytes of RAM. It's a very fast server, powerful server that we use for our application. Next slide. Uh, the next uh, slide there is a picture of one of our three pods. Each of those pods is for people that want to work use networking. That's what we uh, kind of marry you to and say, here, play with this and show you how to work with this stuff, give you all the support, uh, the handhold handholding you need um, to, to work with these devices. Next slide. I mentioned to you that uh, I went back to the university and said uh, that I'm uh, getting great success with this networking lab and I want to, to blow it out. So they went ahead and set up this whole big area for us to move down to. And we still maintain our original location, but this is on the third floor at 163 uh, William Street. And if you advance one more slide, <clears throat> this is what it looked like about, uh, about a week before the pandemic hit us. Uh, so this is, I don't know, mid middle of the day. So you see in the forefront, there's a young lady sitting there with her laptop. She's probably doing a homework. Um, she comes there, uh, that's Helen. She comes there to hang out and do a homework. Uh, periodically, she gets her hands involved in you know, cybersecurity, what have you. The folks in the back are watching some video monitors. That's uh, probably doing, uh, um, showing some videos about cybersecurity. And the people in the forefront on the right-hand side, you can't see them, but there's a server over there. Those are my data science. Uh, people that are, that are working in data science. You want to advance one more? And we'll open it to the panel. Okay, take it away, Emma. I'll come back if, as you need me. Thanks, Dr. Gabberty. Um, so if anybody uh, has questions, feel free to put them into the chat. You can ask them directly to me, to Dr. Gabberty, to any of the panelists as we um, walk through a, a couple questions about the student experience, um, what they've you know, what they've participated in, what kind of engagement they had, and how their experience has gotten them to where they are today. Um, so if you guys could introduce yourselves and just let the, the audience know, uh, you know, your name, your major, your year, maybe something fun about yourself. We'll start with Sammy. I'll be myself. Hello, my name is Sammy Chen Lee. I'm a senior in computer science with a minor in graphic design. I, a fun fact about me, I studied abroad four times, which I'm like super proud of. None of people in like one, one time. I went, I left the country and studied four times. 
Um, but like, you know, of course this year I can't. So that's time like a four. <laughs> Thanks, Sari. <laughs> How about you, Viv? What's going Hi. on? <laughs> Hi, my name is Vivian. I'm a senior <laughs> um, computer science major as well, and I'm minoring in business analytics. Um, a fun fact. Ooh. Oh. Talk about our award. Oh, sure. We can talk about that, Sammy. So um, I'm part, I'm the senior for um, one of the eboards on campus, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, and we had just won an award for most outstanding collaborative event of the year for the university. We hosted our very first hackathon on the New York City campus, a huge event, um, which we can also talk more about in a bit. Thank you. How about Brandon? <laughs> Where is Hi, it? everybody. Um, I'm Brandon DeLuca. Um, I graduated in 2019 with my bachelor's in computer science, and I returned to PACE, and right now I'm doing my master's in information systems with a concentration in cybersecurity. Um, I'm a CyberCore scholar, which is something Dr. Gabri alluded to a little bit earlier. I can um, get more into that later. And uh, a fun fact about me. I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not that fun. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Hansen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kyle Hansen. I'm a junior information systems major with a, getting a minor in computer science and cybersecurity. Um, let's see, something fun about me. I, I, I'm very tall. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yes, these are true statements. That is a fun fact about Kyle. <laughs> um, anyway, so Dr. Gabberty talked a little bit about opportunities, um, not just at the lab, but at Pace and Seidenberg in general. Um, so if you guys could talk a little bit about um, like one of the most useful things that you've learned at Pace, whether it was an experience, a trip, um, a class, um, you know, the coolest thing that you've done at Pace and like what the most useful, memorable thing for you has been? All right, I guess I can go first if no one else wants to go first. Um, so I think um, the most useful thing is, I wouldn't say it was um, any of my coursework. I would say it was more of the stuff that I took inside the classroom and then brought outside to other competitions and other things like that. So um, throughout my classes, I've had different professors that have tried to like push me to the next level and try and take whatever I'm doing in the classroom and try and bring it outside. Um, starting in my freshman year, one of my professors encouraged me to um, take one of my papers that I had written for the class and try and have it published. And um, that was a really cool experience for me. And there I learned a lot of, you know, public speaking skills because I'm speaking to a room full of like 50, 60 people in the auditorium. And there's a little freshman me, you know, uh, learning how to actually do something like that. Um, other than that, there's plenty of other opportunities as well. Um, I've competed in app development competitions as well as cybersecurity competitions. And um, to do those, I needed knowledge that I gained in the classroom. So I think I would say like the most useful thing I've learned is that um, to not let the coursework that you have limit yourself from taking that and going forward. All right, I guess I'll go next. Um, one of the most interesting, or I guess impactful things that happened was um, I competed this year in um, CCDC, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Um, and that's just, it's a basically you're given a network that's been compromised and you just have to basically cleanse the network, kick everybody out and uh, defend it against people that are actively trying to attack your network while maintaining business goals, like bringing up websites, setting up uh, email servers and all of that. And one of the biggest things that we learned was that just how vulnerable computer networks are. I mean, during the standard competition, so we made it through qualifiers just fine. And then during the actual competition, we, we saw how the red teams actively attack a network. And it's kind of scary to watch to know how vulnerable your computers are and how quickly they can just own your, own your network. And it really like, set into my mind like how important cybersecurity is. So I'm also getting a question here um, from one of our attendees about why you guys chose to go into the major of, 
uh, computer science, IT, or information systems. So like kind of what led you to choosing before you were at Pace that that was the role that you wanted and that was the major that you picked? Um, so I guess I can go. Um, so I kind of took like a weird route, I would say, um, according to most people, because most people would say that if you want to do cybersecurity, you should get into information systems. And the reason why I chose computer science is because um, more often than not in computer science jobs. So right now, um, the job that I've been picked up for after I graduate is um, I'm going to be a cybersecurity engineer. And a lot of the work that I'm going to be doing is not really manual security work, meaning um, going in, putting in rules in place and stuff like that. Um, it's more of like automating things and maybe writing code that and that code would automate security for you. So um, having had that computer science degree, it puts me in a good place to say, oh, I know security stuff, but at the same time, I can also code it. So it kind of like gives you a balance of having, you know, like a jack of all trades kind of My decision was a little, <clears throat> sorry, unconventional. I had zero tech background prior to going to Pace and I didn't really know much about coding until like, and it's really ironic because there's been um, an interview done with me that was published that I actually got into coding because of social media back in like way back when, when Tumblr was still a popular media plat social media platform, I started learning how to code by messing around with just Tumblr themes. And that kind of got me into the route where I started wanting to learn more about technology. And I was always a big um, fan of tech, but not necessarily coding and programming and doing any sort of development. But um, my path has changed during my time here. I started off with coding. I'm Now that I'm graduating in May, I'm also transitioning over to learning more about user experience and potentially finding my way um, to get a career um, in user, like focused on user experience. So it's a little bit of a different path for me, but um, that's my story. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, before when I, when I was applying to college, like you guys have been through, um, I was taking my AP programming course. And at that time it was relatively like the newest thing. Um, like 2012 <laughs> or no 16 I don't even know um, but because it was so new I was one of those like jack of all trades I want to do it it was the newest AP course um, and I found out like coding is really real um, and anyone can really do it if that makes sense um, so I would spend like endless nights pulling out all-nighters um, just to find like oh there's a semicolon and that semicolon doesn't work um, and because of that, like, hustle every single night, I, like, really found, like, appreciation for the technology that we have at that time currently. Um, and that's why I kind of went through computer science as a very general, like, umbrella of all tech. Um, and then after that, I came to Seidenberg and found my passion in web design, UI, UX, and a bunch of other things as well. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so that ultimately led you guys to choose PACE. Does anyone have one reason that they want to give why they chose PACE? I know there's probably a thousand reasons, um, but does anyone have like the one thing that stood out to them? Like, okay, that's it. I'm PACE's, PACE in Seidenberg is where I'd like to be. Dean Hill is the reason why I am here. He's not on the call, unfortunately, but he's literally the reason why I'm here. Um, well, part of the re a big part of the reason why I'm here. Um, Sadenberg is one word to one word to describe it. I would say is it's a very large community, and I consider it family. You know, I've went on numerous tours to other universities, to other local um, universities. I, I wasn't planning on going out of state or um, going abroad to study, but um, I had visited numerous universities, and nothing really felt like home. And I know it's strange because you kind of think to yourself, what is the definition of home and how do you, you know, especially if you're going far, far away from home, um, you're letting your child go to school. And when I stopped at Seidenberg, it was my last tour and everyone was so welcoming. I didn't even need to be a student there to already feel welcomed. 
and it was very, very different from all of the other tours. And now that I'm graduating, it's it makes me very sad because I mean, though I can come back to visit all the time, everyone is is my family, and that is the biggest reason why I chose Pace and why I chose Seidenberg. There's this giant feeling of community, and you're never really alone. And though you're far away from home, everybody there is really your family. I can tell you everyone's name and they can probably tell me like, hey, I know who you are. And I'll be like, yeah, I know who you are too. And that's a really, really good feeling for others to know who you are and for you to be able to interact with those same people on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, Vivian. We'll miss you too when you graduate. <laughs> um, there's one opportunity that I wanted to circle back to. Um, you guys are involved in the peer mentor program that happens um, on the New York City campus. And there's a bit of a mashup between the opportunities in peer mentor and working with your mentees and then also being present in Dr. Gabberty's um, lab on the third floor. Um, what kind of engagement have you guys had with the lab and what have been the opportunities that you've um, you know, activities or anything that you've worked with your mentees on? Uh, I guess I can say a little, a little bit about this. So uh, one of the learning modules in a lab is data science. Um, and I found that really um, useful and interesting in my perspective. Um, and like once I learned those skills, I kind of like put on the side and I didn't know when I would need it again until like two days ago um, where I needed to learn, uh, I needed to use SQL to find data in my database for my thesis. So it's kind of like that experience where you will learn anything that you like want to and put it in the back and retrieve it sometime like later in your studies. I find that really useful in my current position. I know my mentees, um, they come in with a certain backgrounds and they learn from it um, relatively fast, like a lot faster than I do. And, and they're doing really well. Hmm. That's what I can say about the lab. It's really cool. Just like, you need to go there. <laughs> So usually what to happens too, there, yeah. yeah, what happens too is our pace bound event, we have the students, you know, in the middle, they go up to the lab and they get to at least visually see it. Um, Dr. Gabberty, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the the Amazon database that you were talking about? Sure. 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 So, um, so one of the things that uh, we, we needed to do was uh, for data science, we need a big data set in order to do any kind of predictive analytics. And you just don't go to the store and buy a big data set of a couple of hundred million records or a billion records or something. So we, we had to create our own. So we assumed, and actually I assumed, that the uh, to make the lab interesting to everybody, um, we took the notion that everybody was starting from scratch and um, didn't really know how to create a database or make the tables or do anything you know, even remotely construed as, as programming. So we, we, we started with um, uh, doing queries and it was an interesting thing that we did. We went and saw, we went and found that uh, lists that are available online in Google, uh, like, you know, give me the top 2000 most frequently used female names in the US, 2000 male names, that's an AF, 4000 people. Uh, and then we took uh, a bunch of last names, several thousand last names. We did something called the Cartesian product, uh, if you know a little bit of linear algebra, and we came up with four million fake people. Then we started choosing random numbers for a street address um, and assigned those to random street names. You know, you, you, there are, there are, you know, government has so many crazy lists of things like most popular street names in the U.S. Um, most popular uh, street types, avenue, way, place, lane, turnpike, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we created these 4 million people that live in the U.S. in various cities in make-believe uh, homes with make-believe addresses. We assigned, using random numbers, we assigned different education levels to them. High school, two-year degree, four-year degree, master's, doctorate. Uh, we assigned statuses. Uh, married, single, widow, divorced. We assigned them credit cards, MasterCard, Visa, 
American Express, and I guess Discover. Uh, then we started doing something called screen scraping uh, on Amazon, where any new student that wanted to be part of the project, we would tell them, go to the books directory at Amazon and just copy uh, the ISBN, the title, the author, the price, uh, the, uh, and any other details about, about books. And we built these tables of books uh, and five other categories. I think we did um, kitchen utensils, uh, makeup, uh, books, movies, CDs, and I forget what the last one is, a you know, film or something. And uh, then what we did was we simulated these 4 million people making random purchases on random days of the year starting in January of 2000. And uh, for each month, we would have 4 million people in January of the year 2000 buying one item from one random category. Then, uh, and we did that for the 12 months. So there's 48 million records. If you have 4 million people times 12, 48 million. Um, then in the year 2001, we said, okay, every customer buys two random items and so on. And what we started to do is when we got to years 2003, 2004, 2005, um, I started throwing the students curveballs and, 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 and do things like make it um, such or make it so that uh, women buy twice as many books as men do and men buy, 20, buy twice, three times as more movies than women do. Or, you know, we just started to do different demographics. Make a single women buy more um, the perfumes than married women. Make uh, married men buy more kitchen utensils than single men. Make divorced women behave this way, et cetera, et cetera. So we had, we, we built up this massive database of hundreds and hundreds of millions of records that um, allows us to say, for example, uh, what does a 32 year old um, uh, divorced woman in, living in, um, Fresno, California, purchase between the hours of 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. on average on any one Friday night who uses an, an American Express card to pay for it. And then what's the likelihood that you know she will buy this item or whatever? So it, it, it involved a little bit of statistics, a lot of SQL programming, SQL programming, um, uh, a lot of algorithms where you're coming up with, you know, how to solve this stuff. It's, it's pretty complicated. And, and if you uh, are familiar with Amazon, you know that when you go on Amazon to buy something, you know, I buy this coffee mug and the coffee mug, um, uh, that I purchase after, after I purchase it, they say, Hey, people that have bought that specific coffee mug have also bought a book on bird watching. Does that interest you or some other category? And the way they know that is because they've sifted through their billions of records to come up with some sort of a predictive analysis of likely consumer behavior. So on a scale of, you know, zero to one, how likely is it that after I buy that coffee mug, I'll buy, I don't you know, bird seed or some wacky thing uh, that you haven't really thought about. So, you know, that kind of, of, um, uh, of predictive analytics is what all companies are looking for. Uh, and the reason that they're looking for that is because of, goes back to what I said earlier, all of us have cell phones. All, all of us use our cell phones and um, carry them with us as we walk around uh, and we go to different stores and we buy different things. So, you know, it's not Big Brother that's watching you. It's Big Industry that's watching you. So when you walk around with your cell phone and that thing is be beeping and letting different uh, routers and switches know that you're walking down the street on fifth avenue and you're outside of a, a men's pie shop and they have a, they have free internet access inside your phone is pinging that router from a privacy perspective you're giving up your right to the privacy of that data so my every single one of us has a unique identifier that identifies our phone so you know, you can really, it gets very, very scary. I don't know who was earlier who made reference to, you know, breaking into networks. Um, but when you realize, you know, if you give me someone's, uh, you know, um, IMEI number of their phone and just say, go tell me some things about this person, 
what I'll be able to find out about you publicly is really scary. Um, and, uh, it, you know, and it's just, it, it's steamrolling where now they're throwing artificial intelligence into the mix. So, um, you know, the, these, these consumer or these, you know, consumer analytics are, are, are kind of red hot in, in, uh, in the world right now um, until privacy people start pushing back. Um, and even when you turn your phone off, your phone is not necessarily off. Um, so it doesn't work to turn your Bluetooth off or, or your Wi-Fi off or something. It's still radio. Um, so, so, you know, that's, uh, that, that's kind of the world of retail. That's the intersection of kind of cybersecurity, um, statistics, telecommunications, big data, uh, data analytics, that's all of them put together. And then the amount of people that can do that these days is, is very, very limited. So if you can, uh, if you can identify two technologies that maybe you're a cyber person, uh, but you're also studying information systems and you kind of like marketing and consumer behavior, you know, put those two together and that's part of the puzzle of this whole predictive analytics thing that we're, that we're, that we're trying to crack. It's fun. It works. It works really well and the students like working on it. Um, the students are doing things like form design, creating different forms to work with, making uh, reports. It's not just the, um, it's just not the, the, the more complicated statistical analysis that, uh, that everybody gets involved with. People that are interested in statistics get involved in that aspect of it. People that are interested in creating for, screen forms or menus or reports, which everybody uses, uh, they can volunteer to get involved in that aspect. And one of the things I wanted to just mention uh, it, uh, at the outset, I should have mentioned, all of this is free, 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 free. Uh, this is free training, free education, free hands-on. You don't get any credit for it. You know, it's kind of like going to Juilliard where you have your formal lessons and you learn how to play the oboe, uh, but then you hang out in the lab with other musicians and you pick up the guitar and you want to sound like, you know, Led Zeppelin or something. And you just play, 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 and they have different instructors that are showing you how to use the technology that you're learning, you know, academically about, but you're doing it on your own time. So this is a free um, opportunity for you to get involved. And, you know, I can tell you that when you're going for a job interview, you can intelligently talk about some of the things I just mentioned to you. You'll talk yourself right into a job because all, all the people I've gone through the lab have done just that. Uh, so, so in the world of IT, in fact, I was just having a conversation earlier with somebody today. Um, for people that are considering studying IT, um, this whole pandemic is, is, is making us change how we do business. But because we have technology, um, like my lab, I don't have to be in my lab in order to interact with my lab. As long as I have a modem, I can gain access to my lab remotely. So I can work with other students online. And in fact, indeed, I do have Zoom meetings with my lab students. Um, during the week, we just, you know, pop up different times and we talk and we still work as though we're all together in the classroom, but instead I have everybody's images on my screen and we work on cool things and we're all accessing the lab remotely. So for us, life has not changed very much at all, other than, like you said, you know, we're, we're situated 15 feet away from our bedroom, so or whatever, versus being in the office or, or at school. So um, the IT world is, a, is, is um, a cool place to be. It's a cool place to study. Uh, I like particularly what uh, Vivian said. Um, Viv is loved by all of us. We're going to miss her greatly. She was one. She is one of our kingpins. Coming down to the second floor and seeing her sitting at that desk every day is one of the things that brightens up my day. Because she's a very cool person, and all the students just love her. Um, so you're gonna, it's going to be a hard void to fill. But we are a very cool family, and we do get along. The unusual thing with Pace University, uh, because I've taught at other universities and uh, have been around other universities, we seem to have this magical thing about us that you know people get along. I think it's because the, the faculty get along very well with the students. Not all of us. There are some old, dodgy, fashion kind of faculty that are kind of boring, like you find at every school. But then there are other people who really enjoy. I, I love working with technology. And I love working with students, so um, it, it's a cool thing to hang out with your professor and work on something very simple like these basic applications. And I love watching them when they when they go off and get hired somewhere, and then five years later they tell me, you know, we had a person in SpaceX, you know, uh, working for Elon Musk, 
it's pretty cool when you get an email, you know, from one of those people that says, oh, you know, was uh, in a meeting today, and Elon Musk walked in. He's such a cool guy, blah, blah, blah. And they say, by the way, I really miss the second floor lab. You know, say hello to Dean Hill and everybody. You know, so we, we get to see our, the results of our, of our labels. Uh, and it's a very nice thing to watch. Our students yeah. get so many jobs. So any decision to study, whether you're doing CS, IT, or IS, you're making the right decision. Stay with technology. That's the future. You'll never not have a job. Even when another pandemic hits us, you'll end up working remotely like we're doing now, uh, and you'll be in a position to do so, so your paycheck will still come. Thanks, Dr. Gabberty. Sure. Um, so one of the last things, just because we're right at the five o'clock hour here, so I just want to cover one other thing. So um, Viv said before, um, which I wanted to talk about a bit, and if anybody else participated in the Sunflower Hack as well, but um, Vivian and Sammy, are part of the Sunflower Hack and the coordination of that, which is run by Women in Tech. Um, you guys want to just talk a bit about your success and how it started and where you are now. Awardees. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, Women in Tech. So Women in Tech was an organization started by many Pace alumna who are famous, famous Pace alumna who are now on to working for bigger companies like Microsoft and Shutterstock. And so I was part of one of the, I think I want to say second generation eboard. Um, a few seniors and a few juniors had short one person for the eboard. And I didn't really know much about campus life at that point in time. And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And through joining that club, I was able to meet industry professionals and at that point on I knew there was something about this organization that I wanted to kind of keep going and then the third generation of the e-board which is now us is consists of myself and Sammy and two other individuals who are not on this call um sorry I, I see that I'm currently lagging a little bit um my internet connection is not super stable but um we're now the third generation of women in tech. And so we decided to host what is known as a legacy event, our first ever hackathon. Um, it was something that we had started brainstorming one day during one of our smaller meetings. And we said, let's do something that has never been done before on the New York City campus, a large scale hackathon where all students that have, don't necessarily have to have experience in technology can participate in and it turned out to be a real success. And I'll let Sammy continue that story. What? You said almost, almost all of it. Oh my goodness. Um, all right, I guess to say about Sunflower Hack, um, I kind of led my team. So like we had different aspects of what to plan. It took about three months of like hard drill um, planning. But during that time, it was, we, there were a lot of meetings. Um, I don't know what to say about it. I could, oh, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it's definitely a space for other students. So like it is not necessarily all for like a Steinberg event. It's for everyone in pace and anyone from like a business background, an art background, a tech background can all work together on a project. Um, I can't remember like the projects that I'm doing in hike, but in a hackathon in general will help showcase your portfolio to employers and that's one of the that can be talked about during your interviews and I find that like just the odd and just like everyone in general at pace um and we ended up winning an award yesterday <laughs> which was like a big deal for all of us since it was like our first time planning and the first time like any of us is doing a large-scale event um so it means a lot that like pace recognizes us for that effort. Thank you guys. Yeah, and congrats again. Um, Brandon and Kyle, do you want to talk about anything about NCL or CCDC before we wrap it up to let the students know about your involvement with cybersecurity? I'm getting a lot of questions about cybersecurity in general. And yeah, sure. Um, um, Kyle can probably talk about CCDC because I didn't compete in that because, you know, um, just like just training conflicts and stuff like times um, but NCL 
Um, so NCL, so Kyle talked about CCDC being more of a um, a red team, blue team competition, which um, in layman's terms is basically attackers versus defenders. Um, so usually you would play the, the blue team, which would try to secure a network against like a foreign threat, which would be the red team. Um, but NCL is not um, that, that same kind of competition. It's a, called a capture the flag competition. And this, uh, these kinds of competitions usually um, will have, have maybe like uh, hundreds of questions, but they're broken into different categories. And yeah, so they're broken into different categories. And each category will test a different skill set that you have. For example, um, one could be password cracking, one could be um, network traffic analysis, you know, analyzing internet traffic. Um, one could be steganography, which relates a little bit to computer forensics. So um, it's kind of uh, just building on your skills in all these little individual areas rather than um, doing something like strictly defending a network. Um, but yeah, Kyle can talk more about CCDC if you want. Yeah, so CCDC um, is basically network defense. Um, they actually just started another one uh, similar to CCDC that's um, collegiate uh, penetration testing. So they had, so there's these, there's these two competitions, basically you go back and forth is how to defend a network, how to attack a network. And you're doing these competitions against professionals. It's not like you're doing it against people who don't know what they're doing. These are people who make their living owning networks against large corporations like Amazon. And these are the people who are like keynote speakers at like DEF CON. So they, these people take a great deal of pleasure about making your life miserable. Um, if you want to watch something fun, you can actually watch the um, owning videos of CCDC on YouTube. They post them. You just search for CCDC Red Team. You can see all the fantastic and annoying stuff they do to the networks. And it will kind of give you an idea of how they, the attackers operate. And you'll see things like Cobalt Strike being used, which are like programs like that you can barely get your hands on. You have to like super verify because they're like just disgustingly overpowered. Um, but you, you, that's the type of stuff you're trying to defend against. So it's not like you're defending against some script kitty in his backyard, copying and pasting a couple of commands he found on Stack Overflow. It's, it's actual real life simulated attacks. So it's really interesting and you learn a lot. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for expressing the things that you're currently involved in and things you have been and, you know, why you chose Pace, Seidenberg, all the, the, the components to making a decision and now where you guys are not knowing where you would be as freshmen. So um, it's nice to hear how you're um, you know, how your four years or like more for Brandon have kind of shaped you into um, the opportunities have shaped you into professionals where you'll either be entering the workforce um, or continuing your educational experience. And thankfully, we get another year with Kyle. So that's fine. And we'll miss wow. the rest. Yeah, so special. Wow. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out and thanks for sticking around for a little bit more than uh, our five o'clock deadline. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to outreach myself, uh, Stephanie Elson, Dr. Gabberty. Um, we'll make sure we get you in touch with somebody. Um, if you have certain questions, I, there were a lot of questions about cybersecurity. So again, if you have questions about that, oh, Steph's here. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we move to the next slide so they can see what the oh, next yeah. steps are. Thanks. For, uh, yeah, because yeah, I know they're thinking about um, their decision and we want to make sure they get some resources, uh, additional information that they're um, checking out our um, social media pages. Um, any kind of webinars that we've had, we want to make sure they're able to find those on our website. So Jill, I don't know if you want to go through that or if you want me to. Yeah, uh, if you, uh, either or. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I would recommend highly is looking at the financial aid video tutorials. They're very helpful. Um, I looked at those when my son was um, in the same position of deciding for college and Dr. Gabbity probably shares the same as I do. Um, webinars that we've done um, over the, the spring, um, you can find them here at this particular link. Uh, a lot more information. We've done webinars uh, about, our, about our design factory, about cybersecurity, um, 
you know, and so these give you and your parents and or guardian lot of information that you're going to need. Um, scholarship, financial aid um, and includes scholarships and grants and loans. And we want to make sure that you are able to uh, research these uh, to know uh, where to go, whether it's internal scholarships to PACE or to Seidenberg or even external scholarships. We have it there on our website. Uh, we, want that, uh, you, we want to make sure that you're checking all of this out. And I think that's it, right, Virgil? Yeah, that is. Um, so yeah, check all those out. We'll have the previously recorded webinars from last evening as well. We had a really fun, engaging, um, create your own game platformer. So we'll have the directions for that um, in the webinar to follow along if you guys want to create your own at home. If anybody has a specific question with cybersecurity or uh, telecom or Cisco Networking Academy, or anything related to what I spoke about. Uh, you see my name, Jay Gabberty, so just send an email to Jay, last name Gabberty, at pace.edu. I happen to be sitting in front of my computer and I can answer your questions uh, happily. So uh, I hope to see you soon. Uh, we have a lot of cool things going on and we are always interested in expanding our team and, and having even more success stories. So hopefully I'll see your smiling faces in the fall. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks again for coming and let us know if you have questions. We'll see y'all soon. Have a great night. All right. Yeah, Thank email. you. Good night. Bye.